an enormous and um, and um, well, Nancy and I go back quite a ways, as do a number of our other classmates who are here. And um, uh, we graduated from Wellesley in 1959, same as Madeline. And um, let's see, Nancy, I think I didn't know you all that well in college, but I got to know you later on in Maine because um, we have a summer cottage in Maine and Nancy lives in Camden when she's not gathering olives in Tuscany. And, and uh, so we see each other every summer, which is wonderful. We go out to, uh, to uh, restaurants and um, we don't have any trouble getting in, do we, Nancy? Not a bit. <laughs> <laughs> or out, as a matter of fact. Um, anyway, I, I do hope that you will enjoy this uh, just as much as, as you did all the, other, um, all the other presentations. And I have here, this is Nancy's, is it your first book? My first, I wrote a novel before that. And I, I, I think I told you the other day, I wrote a, um, a study of ancient Egyptian maritime archaeology and that, which was very, very, it sold all of, I think, 4,000 copies. <laughs> anyway, um, we were having a reunion in 1994, and we have sort of a brag table at the reunion, what have you done, blah, blah, blah. And I saw this book, and I was immediately intrigued and um, got it immediately afterwards. And it certainly is one of my culinary Bibles, um, having lived in Spain and loved being in the Mediterranean and so on. So anyway, um, so we will talk today uh, about the Mediterranean diet, i.e. what people eat, not necessarily be what, what uh, cookbooks and recipes, although those are included as well. And uh, so anyway, Nancy, how many cookbooks have you written, eight? Oh, maybe nine, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I have about five of them. With the update of that Mediterranean diet cookbook called with great imagination, the new Mediterranean diet cookbook. <laughs> Um, and so that was uh, that was one of them. And then I've contributed to a lot of other publications. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I figured that in. But um, I wish I could figure out how to keep these things from blinking on my computer. I'm afraid you're going to hear them because they ding. But we'll put up with it somehow. It seems as though Sunday afternoon is when people send all that sort of stuff. Anyway, that's. Okay, so I will I will be quiet and mute myself, and I hope everybody else will mute themselves. And uh, take it away, Nancy. Thank you very much, Nina. I um I think I am. Am I sharing the screen? No, I'm not quite yet. Um. Uh, yes, you are sharing the screen. You are now. Okay. Um not centered uh go to slideshow nancy right 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 yep. slide right play mm -hmm. from there, there we go. go okay okay so when nina asked me to um to contribute to this wonderful food stories series that she's doing i knew that i wanted to talk about the mediterranean because i spent most of the i would say the happiest and most productive years of my life tramping around the mediterranean i lived in uh in spain in france in uh cyprus in lebanon and most of the time recently most recently in italy but i spent a lot of time traveling also and i lived i worked i raised two children i gardened i cooked i looked at what people were eating i stuck my nose into people's kitchens and my fingers into people's cooking pots and uh out of that i evolved that I cherish about the importance of food in understanding a culture. I think uh, the quickest way to get inside another culture is through its food. And the easiest and most delightful way to get inside another culture is through its food too. But I especially wanted to talk about the Mediterranean diet, which I had a hand in introducing to Americans. Oh gosh, it's almost 30 years ago, incredibly enough. 
30 years. It's, it seems like it was only yesterday. But today, I want to talk to you about the diet and what it is and how it developed. But I also want to put this way of eating in what I think of as the whole Mediterranean context, which I think gives a much better idea, an understanding of what it's all about and why it's so important. So to begin at the beginning with this marvelous painting by Van Gogh, Van Gogh, we say in, in Holland, uh, which comes from the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York. It's a, it's a scene like many of his of Provence. It's an entirely Mediterranean scene of the fields, some plowed and some green, and the olive trees especially, which really determine where the Mediterranean is in the world. Uh, this idea of a healthy way of eating in the Mediterranean was developed many years ago from research that was originally done on the island of Crete and in southern Italy. And it was in these two places that Ansel Keys, who was a very distinguished medical researcher from the Mayo Clinic in, in Minnesota, Ansel Keys and his team that something about the way people were eating in this part of the world was responsible for the overall good health and long life of these people. And this was um, in the early to mid 1950s. So it was really, uh, you know, from this perspective, it was not long after the Second World War. And these places, Southern Italy and Crete, suffered mightily during the Second World War. But despite those kinds of privations, and despite also a very high rate of tobacco use among men, these were places where the chronic diseases of modern civilization, and to be blunt about it, the chronic diseases of the United States were practically absent, and especially cardiovascular diseases. They were so, the rates were so low that they were difficult to study in these countries. So after that first exciting discovery and the idea that diet and, and the overall good health of these people and the long lives of these people were related, the research has been ongoing over the years, including many, many long range studies in many countries, not just the Mediterranean. Um, this is the traditional healthy Mediterranean diet pyramid, as you can see, and it shows in graphic form some of the original conclusions that were determined by the research that was done. It all comes together to, to confirm the importance of this diet in fighting not just cardiovascular problems, but also many other types of cancer, diabetes, especially adult onset diabetes to even cognitive dysfunction. And most recently, anything related to inflammation. Now, inflammation is a current buzzword for what seems to be at the core of so many diseases of aging. And I'm sure we're all very interested in that, especially. Um, I don't ever want to use the word cure in terms of the Mediterranean diet. It doesn't cure anything. It is not a diet to cure. It's a diet that if you maintain it over a period of years, if you are confronted with one of these conditions, it will mitigate it and perhaps even prevent you from succumbing to it uh, following a healthy Mediterranean diet. And it might be simply this, a healthy diet like this, and it doesn't have to be Mediterranean products. It could be Asian, it could be African, but the principles remain the same. A healthy diet combined with an active lifestyle, it's the overall key to resisting so many diseases and disabling conditions, including aging itself. Nancy, Nancy, just a sec. Are you uh, shuffling papers near your microphone? Oh. Sounding too loud? Yes. It's, okay. it's very difficult to hear you. Can you like hold up one page at a time? Uh huh. Try that. Okay. Um, now, uh, or is it? Are you are you moving your mouse? Something's making a grinding sound. Do you have your mouse on on some kind of a surface that doesn't. No, my, this no. is a so my mouse is part of the computer. I don't know. Anyway, um, I'll try to be less shuffly, okay? <laughs> it's, the, it's the shuffling. 
It's the feathers. Okay, shuffle off the buffalo. Um, so uh, I'm thinking that uh, many of you might have encountered the Mediterranean diet uh, when a doctor recommended it to you. A doctor might have recommended it for dealing with high blood pressure, for instance, or as a protective measure if you've been diagnosed with prediabetes. Um, or as a good regimen to follow if you're undergoing treatments for cancer, or like chemotherapy especially. Um, I think, uh, I know that many doctors have recommended um, the book that Nina was holding up originally, the Mediterranean Diet Cookbook for cardiovascular patients as a, as a sensible way to, to live and eat. It's not, a, it's not a deprivation diet. It is a diet that celebrates good food. And you know, it sometimes seems to me that not a single day goes by without another little piece of knowledge being added to this. The research is really ongoing all the time. I have a good example in a recent study that was just published in January of this year, which looked at a cohort of 640 adult Tuscans all of them at the beginning of the study over 65 years of age. And they studied them over a 20 year period and concluded that there was a very strong correlation between their traditional Mediterranean diet and their generally long life and, and, and healthy old age. And that's really good news for all of us. So what is this Mediterranean diet that we hear about Oh, we've been hearing about it over and over again for the last two or three decades, and it still dominates the news cycle for diet, health, and nutrition almost every day. I, I pick up a newspaper, and there it is. It's targeted yet again. Now, anyone who's done a little traveling in that part of the world knows that people in Barcelona eat very differently from people in Beirut, and that Greeks and Tunisians and French and all the other folks who live around the inner sea are similarly distinctive. What they share, however, are two very important things. And the first is what I call a culinary vocabulary. If you think of language being made up of words, these are the words of the language of this cuisine. And it's based on a trio of products. Wheat, this is a Tuscan wheat field in June, right before the harvest. The vine and the olive. And think of these as um, the Mediterranean trilogy or trinity in the same way that you remember if you ever studied Native American diets, you learned that squash and uh, beans and corn, the three sisters of the Iroquois all grew together. Well, the three sisters of the Mediterranean are wheat, the vine and the olive. And beyond that, it's based on a use of, of resources that are as close to local as possible, uh, whether it's seafood or cheeses made locally. These are sheep's milk cheeses being made on a Tuscan farm or wines or vegetables. A typical market in the summertime with the eggplant and um, the uh, these uh, things down here. These are cardoons, they're not celery, and uh, various brassicas, which are very good for us, and tomatoes, of course, celery, cabbages, fennel, uh, play, and there's cauliflower. Fennel plays a big role in, in most Mediterranean countries. Um, but wherever you go, uh, you'll find that the diet is very much a plant-based diet without, without being the least bit vegetarian. But meat is holiday food. It's for Sunday lunch, it's for Shabbat dinner, it's for Easter, it's for Christmas, it's for Passover, it's for the great feast at the end of Ramadan. Ramadan, by the way, began yesterday, I think, or the day before. Or the other way meat is consumed is in small quantities, uh, not more than 100 grams per serving, which is about the size of a deck of cards, mixed in with loads of vegetables and carbohydrates with rice, pasta, bread, couscous, bulgur wheat, and the like. These are very common products that we all think of when we think of the Mediterranean table or a Mediterranean market. And I think they're very familiar to most Americans. This is one of the uh, great appeals of the Mediterranean diet, as far as I'm concerned, is that this culinary vocabulary is familiar to us. We don't need to learn 
something new. We don't need to learn how to use new products in our kitchens. We don't need to confront new products on a restaurant table. We're familiar with this. We know the vocabulary. It's tomatoes, it's garlic, it's onions, it's eggplant. It's these kinds of vegetables. This is the, um, the, the mixings of a salad niçoise with the canned tuna and garlic and peppers and tomatoes and onions and basil right up here and black olives, of course, and hard boiled eggs and bread. Wonderful dish and very, very healthy and good for you. Um, it's greens, both wild greens and greens from the garden. It's legumes, including beans and chickpeas and lentils and fava beans. It's lots of fresh herbs, including unusual herbs like fennel pollen, that fennel we saw earlier here. This is garden fennel, uh, sometimes sold in this country as Florentine fennel, but there's a wild fennel that grows in the Mediterranean and also in California, by the way. And it's a very significant aromatic seasoning uh, in many parts of the Mediterranean, added to everything from fish to pork to um, vegetarian dishes. Um, fresh seafood displayed in the market for everybody to see what it is, <coughs> displayed with their shells on and their heads on and their tails on, so you know exactly what you're getting. And then, and I can't emphasize it enough, excuse me, even though seafood is a really important source of protein, meat itself is eaten rarely, or as I said, in very small quantities. And all of this is cooked and dressed with olive oil. Now, this is an example of olive groves in Spain. Those are all olives as far as you can see. That's how much olive oil this is one small part of Andalusia, which is one large part of Spain. Spain produces more olive oil than any other place in the world. And um, these are some of the, the fields of it. I am not a big fan of this kind of industrialized production. I think it's environmentally challenging, but um, nonetheless, it's a very good example of the importance of olive oil, which is the very, um, the very foundation, I would say, of the Mediterranean diet. And then bread, of course, um, and bread is the carbohydrate at the base of the meal. Now, pasta, couscous, borgel, bulgur, we call it in, in America, I think, um, rice too, these are all important carbohydrates, but bread is a foundation element all around the Mediterranean. Now, this is not news at all. Um, most of these products have a very long history, even a prehistory. The very first Mediterranean civilizations already depended on wheat, wine, and olive oil to sustain them. And this is, again, it's how we define a Mediterranean climate in the world. It's where wheat, grapevines and olive trees will grow as in California, as in South Africa, as in parts of South America. They're referred to as having a Mediterranean climate. Mediterranean climate means um, long, dry, warm winters and cool, rainy, uh, sorry, long, dry, uh, warm summers and cool, rainy winters. And uh, that's important because, of course, the climate is changing there as it is elsewhere in the world. I don't want to get into climate change in this talk because it's much too complex and too interesting and too important to talk. But keep that in mind that our world is changing and the Mediterranean is changing along with it. In fact, I think it's one of the places that is being most challenged by global climate change. Um, so these are products that go far back in human history, as far back as, as uh, the Neolithic period, the earliest kind of agriculture was already dealing with wheat, wine, and olive oil. Uh, then over the centuries, over the millennia since then, various uh, new products have been added. Most importantly were those brought by the Arabs, and that also included a new kind of irrigation-based farming that, that the Arabs had developed in their very dry climate. Uh, and then, of course, the New World uh, products, the products in the Americas in the form of peppers, potatoes, 
corn, and of course, the all important, the star of the Mediterranean table, tomatoes. Now, there are a couple of things I want to point out, um, apart from the importance of extra virgin olive oil. This is not a diet about specific ingredients. It's not keto, it's not paleo, it doesn't have lists of permitted foods and, and unpermitted prohibited foods. It's really about a way of eating more than about individual ingredients. It's not so much a catalog of nutrients and their therapeutic pro properties. Olive oil is good for your, your heart, fish is good for your brain, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But rather the way of thinking not obsessively, but recognizing that eating is one of the most important things that we do in our lives. And this is the second uh, most important thing about the Mediterranean diet. Remember I said there were two elements. One is the, the kind of food they eat and the other is the way eating takes place. Uh, eating is seen in the Mediterranean, recognized by almost every culture, I don't know of any culture that doesn't recognize that eating is a social act. It's a way of communicating, of expressing solidarity and relationships. And of course, it's a way of restoring and maintaining our bodies in good health. At the table, I say, that's the place where strangers become friends and where friends become family. And that's the basis of the Mediterranean sentiment about food. Uh, there's one other point I want to make about that, and there's a considerable amount of research being done into the idea that, you know, I said that it wasn't about single nutrients, it wasn't about tomatoes are good for you for this reason, and, and eggplants are good for you for that reason, but rather about the kind of symbiotic relationships in human metabolism of these combinations. It's possible that tomatoes and eggplant cooked in olive oil do something for your body that eating tomatoes on their own, eating eggplant on its own and having a little olive oil for dessert, let's say, uh, doesn't do. It's that combination which um, each one enhances the other. And the other thing is that it is not a diet cast in stone. It's not immutable. We've seen that many changes have taken place. And uh, I think the best way to think of it is as a movable feast, that it changes from year to year, from decade to decade, and from place to place. So I want to take a look at the Mediterranean diet pyramid now and see if that can help us to understand. This pyramid grew out of a remarkable conference that was held in Cambridge about, oh, I guess it was about 25 years ago when a group of scientists from mostly from the Harvard School of Public Health, but also from other places around the world. Um, Dean Ornish was there for instance, and there were scientists from Italy and from Greece um, so scientists, medical researchers, dietitians, nutritionists, but also chefs and food writers and journalists and the general public that was interested in health, that all got together to take a good hard look at what we were calling the Mediterranean diet and take a look at current research. And this traditional healthy Mediterranean diet pyramid grew out of that. I must say, looking at that now, it looks a little bit dated to me it's not the information is not dated but it sure looks like something that was was made up 25 years ago doesn't it um so it's still valid however even though a lot has changed since then and one area where we've really learned a great deal since that original uh conference is the understanding of olive oil uh, of what olive oil is composed of and why it is such a healthy fat to use in the diet as it, as it is around the Mediterranean. But the basic principles remain the same. And let's look at the bottom layer here, the bottom layer, I hope you can read this, breads, pasta, rice, couscous, polenta, bulgur, other grains, and potatoes. Now, don't dismiss carbohydrates because of all those fancy low-carb, no-carb diets that you see in, in the weight loss magazines. Carbohydrates are actually essential to a healthy diet because they provide your body's fuel, your brain, your heart, your central nervous system. None of that could function without carbohydrates. They are digested faster than protein or than fat, and they fuel your brain and muscles so that you can think and move and, um, and get going with your life.
they're the energy source that kind of keeps your engine running. But this is very important, not just any old carbs. What we stress are complex carbohydrates from things like whole grains. And here, bread and pasta are most exemplary. I have to admit that pasta is not usually whole grain, not in Italy but it's made from Durham wheat flour. This is a, a photo from the Bar Barilla factory outside Bologna, um, and they're making uh, Barilla pasta, obviously, but Barilla pasta is made according to Italian law uh, from Durham wheat flour, which is higher in protein than bread wheat or all-purpose flour. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, any pasta that's imported from Italy will have been made with, with Durham wheat flour. And bread itself is often uh, made from, <laughs> is often made from stone ground flour, which is whole grain by its very nature. Now, these are not, uh, these are very traditional Tuscan breads. I threw this in here because I was so amused when I came across the photo. Um, these are, are made at Easter time in the town in Tuscany where I've lived for many, many years called Cortona. One is uh, this one on the on the left is made with cheese and the one on the right is made with chicholi, which are the little bits of pork that are in, embedded in there, probably of bacon or of uh, pancetta that have been embedded in the bread dough. Artigianale, it says, to reassure you that um, it is handmade. Um, this is a kind of celebratory food and uh, it's very amusing. Most of the bread doesn't look like that. It looks a little bit more like what we would traditionally think bread is. Um, and in North Africa, of course, and in Sicily, couscous is also a significant source of carbohydrates. Um, this is a, a chef in um, Trapani in Sicily, in the west coast of Sicily, who's making a traditional Sicilian couscous, which the Sicilians probably learned from North Africans because there's a great deal of trade, fishing boats especially, back and forth between Sicily and North Africa. In the Middle East, pita and bulgur, uh, pita bread, which is a flat bread, but it's a yeasted bread and often made with sourdough too. And bulgur wheat, which is um, wheat that has been, again, it's durum wheat. It's a hard protein wheat. Um, it has been steamed and then cracked. So it's kind of like a, an instant product. You can mix it with water and it will soften very quickly and turn it into a salad. Um, tabbouleh is the most famous way of treating that. And rice, of course, is, is another significant aspect of, of eating right around the Mediterranean. But the carbohydrates, these products are the building blocks on which everything else has been erected. So next up on the pyramid, we have this big layer of fruits and vegetables and beans and nuts and legumes. And this, these are all to be consumed daily, it says, right up to that line. They're all to be consumed daily. And most of these are also good sources of complex carbohydrates as well as of vitamins, um, really valuable antioxidants. Um, and of course, beans are a good source of protein as well. If you're, uh, if you're essentially a meatless, uh, on a meatless diet, or if you're vegetarian, you want to eat lots and lots of legumes because they will supply the protein that you're missing if you're not getting meat. Um, so the best, the most important thing of all, of course, is that these, all of these vegetables can contribute really delicious, robust flavors to the table. And that's one of the great joys of the Mediterranean diet. And this is one of the areas where the diet is most exemplary. Lentils, chickpeas, beans, also um, bitter greens, wild herbs, foraged herbs. These are, I suppose we would call them in New England, we call these dandelion greens, but they grow in fields everywhere. And they're eagerly, eagerly harvested all over the Mediterranean in the early springtime, which means in many parts of the Mediterranean, February and March, people start shifting to this kind of product in their diet. Um, 
they're rich in variety and they're uh, also rich in methods of cooking. You know, um, you, uh, you find these used, for instance, these wild greens are used as a pasta sauce, or you'll find them thrown into uh, a soup, or you'll find them very often on a big platter with some of those beans that we just looked at, the beans at one end of the platter, the greens at another, so that you can sort of mix and match. That's a wonderful Mediterranean dish. And then, of course, we do not want to ignore our favorite, all important New World vegetable, the tomato. Uh, and I'm sure you know tomatoes are used in an enormous range of ways, They're sliced with salt and a trickle of olive oil as a snack, uh, rubbed into bread as a snack for children when they come home from school, cut off a slice of bread, dribble a little olive oil over it, and then cut a tomato in half and rub that tomato into the, into the fabric of the bread and pass it to the seven-year-old to keep him going until dinner time. Um, they used in soups, of course, either tomato soups or, or, or vegetable minestrones. They obviously used in all kinds of pasta sauces. And don't forget that Italy is not the only place in the Mediterranean that has a lot of pasta in its diet. Much of North Africa includes pasta and Greece includes a lot of pasta. And even in Spain, pasta, especially along the, um, the East Coast, the Catalan coast of Spain, there's a lot of pasta being consumed there. And that's a kind of cross-cultural influence that goes back and forth between Italy and Spain. Um, it's so true, this, this ubiquitous nature of the tomato. Look at the different varieties. These are a San Marzano type. These are, prob these are considered salad tomatoes. And you see how green they are. But in Italy, the green tomatoes are considered especially good for salad because they have that astringency that these riper tomatoes don't have. These, these are sweet and they're considered better for chopping up and adding into a soup or, or making a uh, again, a slab of bread piled with tomatoes, uh, and then these snacking tomatoes back here. But there are many, many, many different types, and every region has its own type of tomato. It's so, uh, so ubiquitous that it's very hard to understand what food must have been like in the Mediterranean before uh, tomatoes arrived from the Americas. And they were not adopted immediately either. It took probably about 150, even 200 years in some places before tomatoes became part of um, part of the way people eat. My neighbor in Tuscany now grows them and she makes up um, 300 jars of preserved tomatoes every year in the fall to see her through the winter and to keep her family supplied. That's how much uh, tomatoes are, are, are a part of people's diets, even in Tuscany. Um, so back to the pyramid we go, and here we come to this critical layer called olive oil. And uh, that, I have to say, we didn't know this when the first Mediterranean diet conference was held, but that must be extra virgin olive oil. Be and there's a reason for that. Extra virgin olive oil is simply crushed, separated from the vegetable water that's, that comes out of the olives and filtered. And this is, this is actually my olive oil going into one of my cans. Um, and you can see how green it is. Why is extra virgin olive oil so important? Because ordinary olive oil has been processed using chemicals and the chemicals are there to strip the oil of its innate qualities of aroma and flavor which because they don't use very good olives are kind of disgusting. So you strip those aromas and flavors away and you have an, a, a tasteless odorless oil to which you add a small amount of extra virgin to uh, give it some taste and flavor. But extra virgin on its own because it hasn't gone through this chemical um, uh, process is full of antioxidant polyphenols, which are the secret to the good health of olive oil. And each one of those polyphenols has a different role to play. People are still trying to tweak out which polyphenol is, is uh, responsible for which um, good health reaction. But the overall impact is uh, a tre tremendously healthy product. I almost, at this stage, I almost don't use any other fat in my kitchen, except 
the occasional butter that comes from a place in Maine where they practically hand make their butter. The other point about olive oil, and this is true of all olive oil, not just extra virgin, is that it's a monounsaturated fat. And a monounsaturated fat works to uh, reduce LDL cholesterol, which is the, the nasty cholesterol, and to stabilize or even increase HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol that you want to have. So for all of these reasons, olive oil is a good product, but extra virgin olive oil is a better product. And it really is worth spending the money on it and using it liberally throughout your cooking. Now, I want to say just one quick word about cooking with olive oil because there is so much misinformation. Um, this is uh, actually, this was in Sicily uh, where a cook on a farm was uh, frying eggplant in, it's the first step in making that wonderful Sicilian dish called caponata, which is a mixture of eggplant and peppers and uh, tomatoes and what else? Celery goes into it, all kinds of delicious vegetables mixed together with a sweet and sour sauce. And it's, a, it's practically the, the iconic dish of Sicily. So here she is frying these in extra virgin olive oil. And a lot of people would say, oh my God, she's making a terrible mistake. Olive oil has such a low smoke point. That's all going to burst into flames. You can't cook with extra virgin olive oil. This is absolute rubbish. The smoke point of olive oil is actually above 415 degrees Fahrenheit, and you certainly do not want to be cooking anything at 415 degrees Fahrenheit in any kind of oil, because you will burn the product that you're trying to cook before the inside actually gets done. Um, you just you don't want a temperature that's even close to that. The best temperature for cooking with extra virgin olive oil is between 360 and 375. That is, I'm talking about deep frying now. Not, obviously, if you throw a little olive oil in a pan and you saute an onion in it, it's never going to reach that temperature anyway. But deep frying, perfectly safe. It does not explode into flames. It doesn't put off a lot of smoke. It doesn't turn carcinogenic. It is because of its antioxidant polyphenols, it is remarkably stable at high temperatures. And above all of that, I have to say, it has been in use in the Mediterranean for centuries and centuries, millennia even. People have always used it to cook with. Um, they used it for perfume as well, and they used it to rub on their bodies, but Oh, and they use it also to light lamps with, but that was the, the, the nasty oil, the oil that today gets turned into regular olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil was always the, the prize for cooking and eating. So back to our pyramid and the fourth layer is cheese and yogurt. I'm not gonna say much about that because you all know what cheese and yogurt are. I will say that until very recent years, yogurt was practically unknown uh, from Italy to the West, Italy, France, and Spain didn't know what yogurt was. I don't know about North Africa during that period, but um, I suspect it was also similar that yogurt simply wasn't part of the diet. Whereas in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, uh, Turkey, Greece, it was an absolute staple. It was the way that you preserved milk and kept it from going sour because you deliberately soured it. And you made this delicious condiment out of it that was used for everything from... Um, um, you know, a dollop in a soup. Uh, it was on the breakfast tray. You would scoop it up with your, your flat pita bread. Um, it was often used to garnish vegetables. It was used in salads. Uh, it was fed to children because it was so benign. It was just a really great product. Uh, and then gradually, I'm going to say probably in the 1960s, it's, you know, when I was when my daughter, now 56 years old, was a baby, I brought her home to Maine to visit her grandparents. And one of her earliest foods was yogurt. I could not buy yogurt anywhere in Maine. We don't realize how recent it has become on our tables now that we can go to the supermarket or even the, the, the mom and pop store on the corner and buy yogurt in 15 or 20 different permutations. It's very recent in our diets, too, and it's very good for you. One of the um, uh, when I was first working on this, one of the uh, 
problems that the Harvard School of Public Health had with this traditional Mediterranean diet pyramid was the lack of what they saw or what they saw as a lack of calcium in it. And they wanted to know how much cheese people ate in the Mediterranean to make up for this lack of calcium. Well, yeah, people tend to sprinkle cheese over everything. People tend to eat cheese for dessert. People often have a piece of cheese for breakfast. And then there's that yogurt that goes everywhere with everything. But the calcium issue didn't seem to be a problem there. And I've always been struck by the fact that calcium, you know, it was the, uh, it was the disease du jour a couple of decades ago. And most women my age were prescribed a very dangerous medication, as it turned out, to keep us from developing osteoporosis. And um, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, it turned out not only to be dangerous, but probably unnecessary. Osteoporosis seems to be a disease of people who are descended from Northern European milk drinking cultures. It is not a disease you find in the uh, Mediterranean where people have a little milk in their coffee in the morning, but otherwise not. It's not a disease in Asia. It's not a disease in Africa. All these places are where people are lactose intolerant and after their first nursing experiences, they don't drink any milk at all and they don't suffer from osteoporosis. So clearly something was going on, but it wasn't, uh, it didn't have to do with calcium. So it's, uh, it's not, um, the, the so-called lack of calcium in the traditional Mediterranean diet pyramid is not really an issue at all. Now, everything that we've talked about so far has been um, something that you should be consuming daily. Then we, uh, we come to the parts of the diet that are be, to be consumed weekly, but not necessarily daily. And that includes fish, of course, which uh, despite the fact that fish has, has become perilously expensive there as it has here, it's still a very important part of people's diets. Fish, poultry, and eggs are the kind of um, uh, low on the budget. Uh, I, I would say poultry and eggs these days are low on the budget. Fish is gets higher and higher. Um, this is the Bocaria market in uh, in uh, Barcelona. And you can see the, all these different kinds of, of um, cephalopods, squid and uh, sepia. And uh, that's another one that may even might be an octopus up there. And then the various shellfish. So in fact, there's something for everyone in this, uh, that looks like a piece of tuna right there. Um, there's something for everyone here, for every pocketbook. And if you don't have very much money, you might buy these things things right here, which are relatively cheap. And you take them home and you'd stuff them with a, a combination of breadcrumbs and onions and garlic and parsley and, and anything else you have, that, and maybe a little cheese and roast them in the oven. If you've got a pocketbook that is bulging with money, you might invest in these beautiful um, shrimpy things here and take them home and just throw them on the grill. So something for everyone means that um, that everyone can, can get a piece of fish when they need it. The biggest change from our American diet, however, is meat. And this, uh, this is a very good illustration of meat eating. These are porchetta pigs getting ready to go into the roasting oven and they will be taken out to a festival somewhere and served up probably by the slice in sandwiches or sometimes people will buy a half kilo of porchetta meat roasted to take home with them. Uh, again, remembering that it is to be consumed a few times a month or more often in very small quantities. The porchetta that goes to the festival, the festival is held once a year. People flock there, they consume as much porchetta as they can, and then they forget about it until the next year. Now, sweets are also up there in that uh, category of not very often. They're at the tip top of the pyramid. And sweets in the Mediterranean, I have to say, this is gelato, of course. Uh, in a little boy with his Roma t uh, football club t-shirt on. That happens to be my grandson some years ago. Um, sweets at the end of the meal are something that are not at all traditional in the Mediterranean. And this is one place where I think Americans sometimes have a problem with the diet because we're used to having 
uh, a piece of cake, a couple of cookies, um, maybe even an old fashioned pudding at the end of the meal. In the Mediterranean, that is not considered proper. Really, what comes at the end of the meal is a piece of fruit, if anything comes at all. And um, the sweet is something that you have when you go out, you go to the ice cream store, or you go to the pastry shop, because it's a certain holiday and a certain sweet is available on that holiday. And you might take it home and entertain everybody in your neighborhood with a slice of that very special cake and a cup of coffee or a glass of sweet wine. But the idea of having it at the end of the meal is just not not part of the Mediterranean. And I think it's one of those areas where we would be well advised to follow, uh, to follow their example and make the sweet something special for a holiday, uh, panforte. And uh, the other thing has become very popular in this country, panettone at Christmas time. Uh, it used to be that these sweets were only available at Christmas. You never found them at other times of the year. And um, nowadays, because of the pressure of the American market, they're available pretty much year round because they're being made year round to satisfy Americans. Um, now, a lot of this has changed, is changing, uh, even as I speak with time, with globalization. The biggest change I think has probably been the introduction of highly processed industrial foods throughout the Mediterranean. It goes into the common diet of people everywhere. And this is the situation here. It is, it's the common people who suffer from this more than uh, more sophisticated, more educated uh, people who have more money to spend on food and are more willing to spend it. So this cheap, fast food and industrial foods uh, have really crept into the diet in a dangerous way. The impact of world markets has been considerable. And it, the result of that is the consumption of more meat, more sweets, more highly processed foods. In uh, Italy, in the supermarket, I see women buying five packages of individually wrapped um, fat, sweet confections, one for each day of the school week to put into their children's um, school bag. The children get their lunch at school and it's usually a healthy lunch, but that little fat industrial sweet is what will keep them going until lunchtime. And to me, that is just uh, heartbreaking to see that happening. It's something we should all be uh, avoiding, I think, ready meals, prepackaged meals, chips, snack bars, all that, that mighty plethora of crispy, salty, fatty, non-foods. This is what Michael Pollan called memorably edible food-like substances, and we don't need them. Now, what I believe, based on more than half a century of observing all of these places in my travels and my, uh, uh, my kitchens and my neighbor's kitchens and my friend's kitchens, is that lifestyle is the real key to the healthful aspects of the Mediterranean. I go back to that second uh, point that I made um, about eating together, eating at the table. Much of the time, lifestyle means cooking and eating at home. Italy still has a, an astonishing number of people who go home for lunch every day. And of course, somebody has to prepare that lunch. And often that's a woman. But I will tell you next door, my, my, my neighbors in Tuscany, who are my great exemplars of all of this, the husband puts the pasta water on, his wife calls him when she's coming back from the market where she has a stall and sells things. She calls him when she gets halfway to our village and says, butta la pasta. And he knows that means he's to put the pasta in to have it ready when she gets home. So that's a, that's a, uh, a desirable change, I think. But um, this, this question of eating at home, eating in a social setting, eating across generations, eating with family and friends, um, eating regularly scheduled meals, 
sitting down at a table, even when you happen to be alone, even in a restaurant, instead of standing up at the bar, respecting food, valuing food quality, valuing the taste, the freshness, the direct and very uncomplicated flavors, valuing the simplicity of preparation. These are two of my favorite olive pickers. Um, one, again, the one on the left is my grandson. And there, I think he was about three years old. And his good friend, Zio Salvatore, Uncle Salvatore, who always comes and helps us when we're picking olives. And they're eating the olive pickers lunch, which is beans cooked with a great deal of fresh olive oil. So, in the Mediterranean world, these are these are time honored traditions. They could as well be uh, in a Greek on a Greek olive farm. They could be on a Lebanese olive farm. They could they wouldn't be on one of those huge industrial farms down in the south of Spain, but they might be on a family farm in Spain. So I'd like to try for us as Americans with the Mediterranean diet to get back to the original delicious food prepared with an innate understanding of what makes it good, serving it with love around a table with friends, family, even strangers. And in a situation like this, as, as I said, strangers very quickly become friends and friends become family. And the food is as good for our bodies as it is for our souls. So in closing, I want to introduce you to an old Italian saying that says so very much. A tavola non sindecia mai. You never grow old at the table. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to hear them. Here we go. Thank you, Nancy. That was great. I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed that enormously, Nancy. Thank, thank you. Me. I'm glad. I see there are a couple of questions in the, um, uh, oh, everyone mute noise. Maybe Nancy's shuffling her papers, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a question at the bottom of the chat. You scroll all the way down. Okay. Um, my brother swears by Amphora Premium Extra Virgin Olive Oil. He and his wife drink a tablespoon of it every day. Comment. Uh, I knew a very famous writer in England. She was actually Australian, but um, she claimed that she had beautiful skin. I didn't recognize that her skin was particularly beautiful, but she said it was. And she said it was that way because she drank a tablespoon of olive oil every day. So Katie Van Giel, maybe your brother and his wife have beautiful skin, do they? Uh, I've never really looked that closely. I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to. <laughs> but it's very expensive, apparently. Uh, and I and I don't know if I should uh, uh, to use it for cooking because it's it's too precious. Or uh, well, if I you're going to oh, oh, you know, spend sixty dollars a bottle on olive oil, I wouldn't use it for cooking. Uh, but there's plenty of of. Did you say sixty dollars a bottle? Yeah. I wouldn't use it for cooking. I'd use it for garnishing. Um, you know, my olive oil probably costs sixty dollars a bottle when you think of the amount of effort that goes into it. But I've never managed to figure that out. Um, yeah, uh, olive oil is expensive. Um, good things are expensive. Good wine is expensive. Good wine you can <coughs> in one, excuse me, maybe two bottles of it in one meal, or if there are enough of you around the table. Um, Good olive oil takes you probably even using it to cook with. It will probably take you a week or more to consume a bottle. Um, there is some very good olive oil from Greece, extra virgin, of course, some very good olive oil from Spain. There's some very good olive oil from uh, California, um, which are all perfectly acceptable for cooking with and not bursting with flavor. They're not the kind of thing you want to garnish your salad or your toast in the morning or your baked potato. That to me is a dream combination. It's baked potato with a really high class extra virgin olive oil poured into it and a, and a little bit of sea salt too. But, um, but these, uh, these Greek and uh, Spanish and California olive oils are not that expensive and you can buy them usually in five liter tins. You can go online and find them um, in various places. 
uh, one place that I always tell people to go to for a good range of olive oils from all over the world is Market Hall Foods in Oakland, which is a wonderful big supermarket of fine food. And they have olive oil from everywhere, but especially from California. So you can kind of rely on them. And also, you know, when you buy online from an outfit like that, if you get something that isn't good, you know where to go to send it back and ask for your money back. Whereas if you just buy it off the street somewhere or in your local Hannaford's or whatever supermarket, you really can't take it back unless the packaging is defective. Um, so I recommend very highly buying online. I think that that's a really, the other thing uh, that you should pay attention to in buying any kind of olive oil, well, any kind of extra virgin is the harvest date. And the finest producers will put the date that the olives were harvested on it. That's more important than the use by date. And I'll explain to you why the use by date is two years after the olives, olive oil was bottled. But the olive oil could already be a year and a half old at the point when it's bottled. So that means if you're buying it close to the expiration date, it's already three and a half uh, years old and it's probably not very good. It certainly isn't good. It certainly isn't worth the price that you're going to be asked uh, to pay for it. Is it harmful at that point? No, it's not harmful, but you're, you know, you're paying a lot for a quality product. And if it's not a quality product, no, I, in fact, as long as it doesn't have any off flavors, and I think it's difficult for Americans to recognize those off flavors. It's a kind of rancidity, uh, uh, something that we call fusty flavors, which are usually made from olives that have been kept too long before processing. Uh, these flavors are not going to hurt you. Uh, and you might want to consider using that for cooking rather than, um, I, but I, I wouldn't put something that's got that kind of flavor on a salad because you'll taste it immediately. But it's, it, you need to taste and taste and taste olive oil until you understand what good olive oil tastes like. The University of California did a taste test, uh, well, probably 15 years ago, and found to their horror that most Americans in California preferred rancid olive oil. Ew. That was the flavor that they were used to. It's like it's like little kids who buy anything but um but uh canned orange juice and they don't want fresh orange juice because it's got bits in it, first of all, and it has a funny flavor to them. So gradually we're learning, we're understanding as a as a food culture what good olive oil means, but there's still a tremendous amount of misinformation out there, including that business about not being able to cook with it. But look for the harvest date. If you see the harvest date, you can be pretty certain that you're getting your money's worth. Thank you. Bonnie, did you have a question? Yes. Can I you give everybody, but I, I just saw Bonnie put her hand up. Okay, can you give us any brand names? We're, we're far from California. Well, you can go online to Market Hall Foods and you can look okay. at what's available. I would suggest you do that. The problem with giving a brand name, and I can tell you that um, that my favorite olive oil after my own is, uh, oh shoot, I can't even remember the name of it now, um, from Sicily. And you can go to your market, uh, your, your uh, gourmet foods market and find a bottle of that olive oil. And it may well be four years old. So it won't be worth your spending the money on it. Um, the other thing is, if I tell you a brand, everybody will fan out over Western Massachusetts looking for that brand and you won't find it because it's not, it's not being sold. The kind of, of high class olive oil I'm talking about is usually produced in small quantities and um, uh, and so they don't have massive distribution uh, and they're distributing mostly in Germany, the United States and the UK. And so we're lucky when we see these things here or we get them through an online distributor. Um, a lot of really fine Italian olive oil comes through a place called Gustiamo, G-U-S-T-I-A-M-O. And that's an online uh, seller of Italian olive oil. It's based in the Bronx and they're very, very good. Um, 
So, uh, I mean, I, I, I am reluctant to describe particular brands just because of the, of the difficulty of finding them. And I can't guarantee once you do find them that they're in the condition that you want them to be in. This gentleman up here, Teal Van Giel, another Van Giel, has had his hand up for a long time. Uh, hi, thank you. We, we have friends, uh, the, the, the husband in the family had a, a heart a heart problem, and he became a devotee of Dean Ornish, and you mentioned his name. I wonder what he thinks of a diet that involves, you know, olive oil, which is a fat, which uh, the way our friends interpret Ornish is you cut out all fat to deal with your heart. Yeah, I, I know Dean Ornish, I, I mentioned he was at that uh, at that conference. Um, he doesn't think much of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, I think that to follow the Ornish diet, you're following a diet of extreme deprivation. And maybe it's worth it if you are dying of heart disease. But if you're not dying of heart disease, if your doctor has said, oh, you're a little overweight or, oh, you got a kind of a high blood pressure. I want to take you to take these pills and see if we can get that down um, or whatever. Uh, you don't need a deprivation diet. A deprivation diet is going to make your life miserable. And I, you know, maybe if I follow Dean Ornish's diet, I might live to be 108 instead of 98. <laughs> um, but I'd rather live happily dining <laughs> and cooking to the age of 98 than to live to 108 without any fat in my diet. And knowing that this is a good fat, that it, it has a good effect on my cholesterol levels, that it also has all those polyphenols that help me fend off all kinds of diseases is a big plus as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie Vigeland. Um, hi. Uh, it's fascinating talk. Um, and just picking up on something that you had said, I have a friend in Sicily um, who um, thinks olive oil from Sicily is the best. Um, and she counsels all everyone she knows to always buy in small quantities um, that she just said, never, ever buy the stuff that's in a tin or even really by the leader. Um, she said, you know, the smallest quantity that you can buy. I guess, I guess this is this issue of rancidity? I don't know. Well, it isn't really. And I would, I would disagree with her. I think if you're, if you're buying carefully <clears throat> and if you're looking at, at harvest dates and, and all that sort of thing, um, you will find, first of all, the best bargain is in five liter tins. You get that five liter tin home and you don't put it up uh, next to your stove where it's going to get all the heat from the stove. You put it in your unheated pantry. You tap off maybe half a liter at a time and keep that by the stove and keep the rest of it. As long as the olive oil is kept in a dark, cool, but not cold place. I mean, I've had olive oil in Sicily, by the way. I had friends who had bought a palazzo in the center of Castel Vetrano and they discovered in the basement of the palazzo five big fats of vats, sorry, fats of vats, five big terracotta vats, these enormous old fashioned terracotta vats of olive oil, which they figured was at least eight years old. And we tasted it and it tasted fine. So, um, you know, the standard procedure is the olive oil is good for two years after harvest. What that really means is that the flavors in the olive oil are most predominant up to two years after harvest, but the olive oil itself doesn't go bad after that. Um, so I don't think, I mean, I think as long as you're careful about what you're buying, you don't want to buy commodity olive oil. You don't want to buy olive oil. It says on it, this has been sourced from, uh, you know, all the countries of the European Union, which means Greece, France, Spain, Portugal, uh, and God knows where else, um, and mixed together somewhere in Southern Spain into a big vat. What you want is oil that is produced by a single producer 
on her estate usually and uh, or produced by a cooperative that has the um, the information on the label about where it comes from. And very often what it will be is what's called in Europe a DOP, a denomination of protected origin, which is a, an, a, um, it's not really an award. It's a kind of a guarantee that is offered by the European, uh, the common market agricultural commission um, that the olives come from groves in a specific area that they've been harvested at a specific time, pressed under specific circumstances. And as far as anybody knows, the oil inside is as good as it can get. So those are all, uh, you know, if you buy a DOP olive oil from Greece, um, where it has a different name from DOP, but I can't remember what it is. Um, mm -hmm. um, then you, and, and, and the date on it is within the accepted period of time. Then you take that home and again, you store it in a cool, dry, dark place and you, um, you tap off what you need when you need it. I'll tell you, I once walked, wandered into a Whole Foods in Portland, Maine, after I'd just gotten back from a trip to Sicily. And there was my friend's olive oil on the high shelf of Whole Foods Market in Portland underneath the shop lights. And I pulled the bottle down and you oh. never would have recognized it as the oil that I had been tasting in Castelvetrano at that time. So, you know, once it leaves the producer's hands, they have very little control over it. Nina, did you have a question? I had two, uh, Nancy. Uh, first of all, um, the business with the tomatoes taking so very long to get accepted in Europe, it was similar with the potatoes. And um, they didn't know exactly. Then there's that probably apocryphal story about Frederick the Great. Do you know the story? Um, that he, um, um, he planted some potatoes and they were ready for harvesting. And um, the villagers around, they didn't want any part of this stuff coming out of the ground. And so what he did is he put a guard around the potato field to show that it was something very, very precious. Yes. And, then, and then he had his guards go to sleep at night. And then the peasants came in and dug up the potatoes and tried them and said, "Woo, this isn't bad. So they started eating potatoes, which had an effect on warfare. Because before that, uh, if you wanted to wipe somebody out in terms of food, you could just take a torch to this, like the very nice wheat field you showed us, Nancy, and burn the whole damn thing up and they wouldn't have anything to eat. You can't do that with potatoes. Oh, yeah. you know, they're okay. under the ground and they're damp and you just, so, you know, screw the military. Oh, um, <laughs> B, um, I have never tried, although I've seen in your, in your cookbooks, you have a number of olive oil cakes and I've never tried them. Uh, tell us a little bit about them. <laughs> They're delicious. It makes a very soft texture. Um, and, you know, my daughter, my chef daughter, is has become much more of an expert at this than I am now. But I keep seeing, you know, every time I see an olive oil cake on that tedious New York Times list of what you should cook today, <laughs> I open it out and add it to my collection. And I have an enormous collection. I could actually put together the olive oil cake cookbook if I felt like it there are so many of these around but um no it's it's an interesting task because we think of butter in terms of cake and butter makes a delicious cake but olive oil makes a different kind of cake i think um i think olive oil cakes tend to last a little bit longer if you can keep mm -hmm. yourself from eating them all up and um they also have um a more moist texture naturally because there's more moisture in olive oil than there is in butter i like it a lot <clears throat> I like um, I like using olive oil in a lot of sweets. I have a recipe in one of my cookbooks for an olive oil cookie that an um, olive oil miller's wife made for me that was just wonderful. I can't remember what her, oh Mrs. Funcelli. Nancy, when you bake a when you bake an olive oil cake, do you generally bake it in one layer? I bake cakes in one layer anyway. Yeah, I don't yeah like me too. Um, I don't like I don't like having to put stuff in the middle. No, me either. Hmm. Jam and chocolate or something like that. I know I'm a uh, <laughs> I, I'm in the minority. I'm not a big fan of chocolate. Um, 
and I am not a big fan of jam. I have, I shouldn't admit this in public, but I have a friend who is a tremendously talented jam maker. She makes jam all the time. Every time I go to her house, every time she comes to my house, she brings me a jar of jam. I have a pantry that's got about five shelves full of her jam. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. Every now and then, then I make what is Italian is called a crostata, which is just a very simple um, pie. You, you roll out pie dough and you smear delicious jam all over it and you put a lattice crust on the top of it and you bake it and it's delicious and it's a great way to use up jam. But putting it on my breakfast toast, no, thank you. I'd rather have olive oil. I like toast with a, a little clove of garlic rubbed across it but after it's toasted, when it's kind of crispy and crunchy. And then olive oil dribbled on top of that. Yes, Mr. Van Giel. Van Giel. I have a, 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 a cooking uh, question. I think you mentioned using wild greens for pesto sauce. Do you prepare, would you prepare it the same way as you would with uh, I think basil or pozzel? I, I, think, I think you misunderstood something I said. Okay, all right. I probably could make a pesto with wild greens, but they tend to be, I mean, basil after all, uh, which is one of the classic uh, elements in a in a Genovese pesto, at least, is very sweet. And bitter greens have a bitterness to them that would come out in there. And I don't know how you would overcome that. There is a wonderful pesto made in, um, in Sicily, by the way. We seem to be talking about Sicily a lot this afternoon, but it's called um, pesto trapanese. And it's made with tomatoes and almonds. And it's really delicious. And it does not have any basil in it at all does have garlic, garlic and almonds and tomatoes all pounded together. And then traditionally it's served with this very curly cue, um, uh, whole grain pasta that they make in Trapani. Um, so if you go to Trapani, and I advise you all to do that because it's a fascinating place, um, try their um, uh, pesto trapanese or buy a copy of one of my cookbooks. I can't tell you which one, but one of them has that recipe in it. Mm -hmm. and Buy them all and you'll find the recipe. Um, that's rank commercialism, sorry. <laughs> that, thanks, it sounds delicious, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now we have a, something in the chat here. A big news story a few years ago that was much of what was labeled olive oil is not, even somewhat costly olive oil from whole paycheck. Do you know if this is still an issue? It's challenging if one cannot afford expensive olive oil unless one turns to the supermarket. Well, it wasn't a few years ago, it was about 15 years ago and um, <laughs> The, the point, uh, the writer was trying to make the point that all olive oil has been tainted by, by horrible Italian mafiosi. This is a man who actually lives in Italy, much of the man he does. And um, I objected to it because I thought, first of all, he didn't recognize the fact that most of the controls on false olive oil are imposed by the Italian government and followed through by, they have a special division of the Carabinieri, which does nothing but trace food fraud of all kinds. And olive oil is one of the biggest areas for that. Uh, expensive olive oil usually is, uh, again, read the label. Don't just read the cost on the ticket. Read the label. Find olive oil that is made and bottled on the estate. Olive oil that comes from a, a protected denomination of origin. Olive oil that has information on it about the kinds of olives that are used, the date of harvest, um, uh, the use by date, as I said, is a little unclear. All, but the most important thing is to stay away from the commercial olive oils, which are the ones where fraud. And the other thing that you have to understand is that even though all these fraudulent oils have Italian names, that's a marketing tool. In fact, most of them are owned by a Spanish multinational called Beoleo, which owns ever so many of those big industrial brands of olive oil. And so Italians are getting tarred and feathered with um, with Spanish problems. What, what grapes do you recommend? Excuse me for jumping in. What grapes? What grapes do you- Oh, do you well, we grow uh, Sangiovese grapes, but that's because it's, it's traditional in our part of Tuscany. Sangiovese is a big grape in, in Tuscany. Um, 
but other parts of it, the thing that's fascinating to me about Italian uh, grapes in particular is that so many of the varieties that are used are what's called autochthonal, meaning I, I always try to explain that by saying it doesn't mean that they're native because grapes aren't native to Italy. They came from, from the Caspian Sea originally, but that they've been there so long, they might as well be native. So they're autochthonous. Uh, if you go, if you look at a list of, of wines from Puglia, for instance, in the heel of the Italian boot, you will find that there are ever so many single varietal wines that are made from grapes that grow only in that region of Puglia. And one of them is the Primitivo grape, which is often thought to be, although this is contested, the origin of California's Zinfandel. So that's an interesting connection there. Or Sicily, another area where you can find uh, uh, grapes that are not grown anywhere else in the world except in Sicily. In Zolia, for instance, which is a white wine grape. Or uh, uh, is it Negro Amaro, I think it's from Puglia. Um, Nero Davola, that's another Sicilian, that's a red wine grape from Sicily. But Nero Davola is only grown in one small region of Sicily itself. So you really um, you find a good wine merchant who knows something about wine, and there are some out there. I would recommend also any book by my friend, my great friend, Burton Anderson, although his books are quite out of date now. But he wrote a book that was published in, I think, the 1980s about, I think it was called Vino, and it was about Italian wine. He was an editor at the Herald Tribune in Paris, and he got, and got very intrigued by Italian wines and studied and studied and met all the vintners and went all around the country and wrote this book called Vino. And it's a wonderful introduction to the complexity of of Italian wine. I don't know, I think a similar kind of situation obtains in Spain and certainly in the south of France, although the French find it so easy to grow Cabernet Sauvignon and, and um, uh, Chardonnay that a lot of modern growers have just switched to that and nothing else. And as a result, their vines have suffered, that, not their vines, their, their wines have suffered tremendously. Um, the North Africans don't produce much in the way of wine because they're mostly Muslim and they, when they produce wine, they're producing it for a European market and usually to boost the alcoholic content of European wines. So I discount most North African wines. Lebanon produces a few good wines, uh, but they're very hard to find. We're talking about olive oil though. Oh, I thought you said what? No, 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 no. You had no, said I'm talking about, I'm talking about that, wines. Wines. Yeah. This, yeah. No, no, no. We we're talking about olive oil that comes from vines that are are olive. Olive oil doesn't come from vines. Olive. Oh, I understand. Yeah. yeah. That what olive? What, what olives? Yeah. Oh well. Okay. Uh, it Sorry. depends. Um, and it depends on where you are in the world, because as with grapevines, which is what I thought you were referring I'm to. I'm sorry, I may have misspoke. Yeah, um, it, it depends on where you are. Uh, the, the olive trees that are grown in on the island of Crete are very different from the olive trees that are grown on the island of Corsica, for instance, which are very different from the trees that are grown in the south of France or in, in Catalonia or in Andalusia or in Italy, Tuscan uh, olives are very different from uh, Sicilian olives or Pugliese olives. So everywhere you go, you will see different varieties of olives being grown. So it's hard to say uh, what, what kinds you look for. You know, you look for what's being grown in that particular region, basically. I'm sorry, I completely misunderstood. I, I think I may have oh. misspoken. Um, <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> yeah. Nina, I see your hand raised again. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I happen to be somebody, and I know a few more in this room too, uh, who utterly loathes cilantro. I cannot eat it. It tastes wicked awful to me. Give uh, me the background, Nina. That is astonishing to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've never liked it. Except one time I went to a conference in Mexico and I was served a, 
a cold soup beforehand, which I ate down and it had little green flecks in it. And I said, uh, excuse me, but what kind of soup is that? And they said, crema de cilantro. So there I was hung by my own petard. But no, mostly, you know, I just, I just hate it. And other people love it. And um, what would you suggest as a substitute for cilantro? Parsley? Italian. Flat leaf parsley. Yeah. Um, okay, good. I good. mean, it depends on what you want to do with it. You know, what I find about cilantro is that it, uh, it has a very evanescent flavor for me, at least. I never use it in cooking. I always add it. You know, it's like when you make guacamole, you, you add cilantro to it and that's fine because you don't cook it. But if I were making a soup, I would put it on at the end uh, and not not stir it into the, the um, basic mix of the soup. Uh, the same thing I think is true of basil. It's hard to... Uh, basil's flavor disappears in that kind of combination, but maybe throwing chopped basil on the top of the soup instead of cilantro would be a good idea. I, it, you know, so much of it depends on on personal taste. Sorrel, chopped sorrel, would be very nice there. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, tarragon, you know, there are all kinds of green herbs that you could use, and then obviously the flavor of the soup is going to be very different based on sure. that. Sure, but yep. it's very much a matter of personal taste. Okay, I think we're nearing uh, three minutes uh, before splashdown. Does anybody have any more questions? If not, Nancy, thank you so very much. Thank you. And, uh, you were a fountain of information and I'm just glad I have access to you in the summertime. This is very good. Okay, and Mindy, thank you so much for all of your expertise. Thank you. I don't get I don't get sweaty palms when Mindy is at my side, I tell you. it's. It's really good. Nancy, we have all become family. <laughs> okay, guys, I think that's probably it. So, uh, if, wait a minute, there's one more chat which says. I just said thank you. Oh, thank you. Good. All right. Thank you, good. everybody. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, everyone who came. Thank you for all your fascinating questions. Thank and you for all your information. <laughs>